So I'm your host, Sri Ayer. Today we go to Karnataka. Karnataka is a state where there are at least five languages that are in use that I can count. There is Kannada, there is Tulu, there is Sanketi, which is a mix of Kannada and uh, Tamil. And then there is Samskritam. There is one village called Madhur, where Samskritam is spoken by almost all the villages there. And then the final one, which is Konkani. The guest that we are going to talk today with, his mother tongue is Konkani. And uh, whenever he comes on TV, and he's a very famous TV personality, by the way, whenever he comes on TV, uh, he's usually introduced as the ex-CFO of a very famous company. I I'm going to break the suspense now. Um, welcome to uh, P Guru's channel, Mohandas Payavare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I have known Mohandas Paiji for a couple of years now, and we keep running into each other in uh, various uh, functions. Uh, we have a lot of things that we have a lot of common interests. And uh, one thing I've noticed with Mohandas Paiji is his simplicity. I've seen him wearing what he's wearing today in this interview, whether it was in LA or whether it was in his office in Bangalore. And, and this really personifies him. Now, uh, Sri Mohandas Paiji has had a very uh, distinguished career in Infosys as its CFO when he was there over its growth period. And uh, we are now going to go back to the very beginning when Mohandas Paiji started out his education in St. Joseph's. Uh, Mohandas Paiji, why don't you uh, um, relate to us your journey thus far? Well, I was uh, born in 1958, November. My mother was a school teacher in a government school. She grew up in very poor circumstances, stood first in the district of Kur and joined government service as a school teacher. My father used to work in an office uh, as an administrator, later he became a branch manager. We were reasonably well off. I went to a local school, Vishwakalani Ketan, joined St. Joseph Indian High School in class 7 in Bangalore. And I used to go in my father's car. My father had a car in those days in 1971. Uh, and then, of course, I was uh, in the top five in my school. And then I went to college in St. Joseph's Commerce College. I got the third rank in the university. Then I went on to do my CA. I got a national rank in the inter and final examination. While doing CA, I uh, um, did my law too in the University Law College in Bangalore. And then I started my practice because I was a rebel those days. I said, I'll never work for anybody. I want to be independent. And practice went well, did great work, except nobody paid me good money. So we didn't make uh, much money. But I had a hobby. I used to read annual reports. I had a collection of 3,000 annual reports by the time I was 22, 23. I read all of them. And we used to go to shareholders meeting in Bangalore and uh, harass the management by asking very deep questions about the financial statements. So it was all good fun. Then in 1986, I, my friend who was uh, from Prakash Road Lines asked me to head a company called Prakash Leasing. I became the executive director. So I never worked for anybody. I ran this company and I ran it well, make it, made it one of the best companies in Bangalore till about 1993. In the 93, late 93, the family had a family dispute. I'm a friend of mine at uh, the banker for Infosys in a very small company. I went for the investors meet, asked them some questions, applied in the stock, went to the shareholders meet, asked questions to Murthy and colleagues, then went to their analyst meet in Mumbai in uh, July of 1993, I mean, not July, October of 1993, asking questions. And in October, November, Nandan came and met me and said, why don't you join? So I joined them as a consultant in uh, 1994, January. And I joined them as a consultant because I didn't want to be an employee. I wanted to help their finance, but I didn't want to be an employee. I wrote the first stock option plan in 94, helped them raise 25 crores as a private placement, which money still sat in the bank, is sitting in the bank even now, because they didn't need the money, but the money was good to have in the balance sheet. And then in October, Muthi came to my room in Infosys, he said, Ravam, tomorrow you're joining, and made me join. He said he spoke to in London and he said he must join. So I was CFO. Uh, we produced the first great annual report in India, which was the standard gold standard. It sold in the black market for its quality. And from then on, we won uh, awards for 10 consecutive years to the Institute of Chartered Accountants, the best uh, annual report with great disclosure. We did US gap accounting. We did many things in investor protection. We did things in uh, um, 
in other regulatory aspects, set the standards, both in accounting, in financial disclosure, investor relations, etc. I used to meet 300 investors a year. There were only two of us at that point of time, KK Misri and me, going around the world, talking to investors. Then I worked with Muthi to help build the Infosys campuses. We built 40 million square feet, did the NASDAQ listing in 1999. I remember that uh, we had a full book at $37 and we went and told the bankers we want a cutoff at 34 So they were shocked. They said nobody's asked to reduce the price. But we wanted to leave on the table and the stock went, went up to 53 on the opening day. It was fantastic. It was a great event in 1999. The NASDAQ listing, first company from India, we were then $3.6 billion. Then grew the company. Then of course we had in 2002, we had this uh, bust in the internet and the stock fell 40% in two days. So below the company did an ADR, did everything. In 2006, uh, 2005, I told Muthi, I want to step down as CFO. I was the best CFO in India. Everybody had given me the award. Everybody used to meet me and the great job, but I felt I must step down and let my other colleagues take over because you must always build a team and have your colleagues share the sunlight and make sure they also step into shoes, not hang on to your position. Then I said, I want to quit. But Muthi told me, no, hang on. And he took him one year to allow me to go. And he said, you, you, you take over HR. So I became the director of HR. The Finacal business he reported to me. I was chairman of the BPO company after Furnish Muthi left. Then for five years, uh, I must have hired about 200,000 people, built the corporate university in Mysore, uh, trained 250,000 people, and took the company up to $6.5 billion. I left in 2011. I think April 11, 2011, I left the company because I wanted my life back. And uh, having spent uh, 17 years at Infosys, 24 into 7, traveling, not seeing my family, not seeing my two boys grow up, not spending time with my wife, I thought I must get my life back. When I left, the media asked me, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to spend one third time for public affairs, one third for the corporate, and one third with family. Now the one third has become the time I go home to sleep. If at all I go home, I travel 16 days a year, a month. And I think I work much harder than I did at uh, Infosys. Harder in the sense that you do so many multi multifarious things. So it is very stressful. Now after that, I joined with Ranjan Pai of Manipal to start adding capital. I became chairman of his company, the non-executive manner called Manipal Global Education. We run universities in uh, Nepal, in Malaysia, medical school and the technology university in uh, Dubai and in Antigua and we have a training business in India, we have an assessment business in India and is, a quite a, is, is leading in that particular field. Then we started adding capital and through adding capital we set up 10 other funds. So today we have uh, 250 investments in startups. We get two and a half, three thousand companies coming to us, meeting us every year. 400 million dollars of uh, investment has been put in and we got these 10 funds in various areas including uh, India's first woman entrepreneurship fund, a small cap, small market fund, a small cap fund, a, a real estate fund, deep technology fund, etc. And I work with the government on policy. We help write the startup policy for Karnataka for the state of Rajasthan. We help write the electric vehicle policy for Karnataka. And we help do the startup event for the Prime Minister Modi. And uh, we conceptualize the idea of the 10,000 crore fund of fund for startups in India. So work in the public area, so the great life. In 2000, we started Akshay Patra Foundation to deliver midday meals to school children. We started with 1,500 children, went to 25,000, 50,000, 100,000, 500,000. Now we feed 1.6 million children, a hot unlimited midday meal every single day from centralized and decentralized kitchens all over India with high quality technology. And we are delivered 2.6 billion meals so far. We spend about 350 crores a year Maybe one of the largest NGOs in India, 60% of funding is by government, the balance that we raise is won awards for excellence in food delivery, food quality, etc. So that has really helped millions of school children improve their nutrition, you know, further their career, give them confidence, etc. I only work to give scholarship to many people for the company community, for the general community. So many things, we started the Bangalore Political Action Committee to improve governance, the city of Bangalore. Uh, I work with the Carnegie Tech Forum in Bangalore. I help uh, work with Manjit Kripalani on Gateway India, which is the think tank for uh, business and foreign affairs in uh, Mumbai. So many things. It's a very, very rich life. So enjoying myself immensely. And uh, as you can see, I'm very fond of my country. I believe I'm a patriot. I'm a nationalist. I love my country. 
and I will defend my country against any of these leftist malcontents who are ruining the India narrative. And for those of you who may not know about data, let me give this piece of data. From 1991, when we opened up till today, 2017 March, India has grown at 8.8 percent cargo from $275 billion to a GDP of $2.25 trillion. In PPP terms, yes, uh, sir, uh, yes, yes, yes. Just to explain AGR, I think that's what. I think that's what. Yeah, cumulative annual growth rate. Yeah. Cumulative yeah. annual growth rate. That means it's grown at 8.8 percent .8 a year for 26 years. The only large economy which is grown at more than that is China, which grew at 9.9 percent .9 a year from 1978 till about 2014. And um, India's uh, PPP GDP, purchasing power parity GDP, is 8.8 .8 trillion dollars. It's a very large economy. We got a steel making capacity of 125 million tons, the second largest in the world, more than the US and Japan. Uh, we have a, a capacity of 375 million tons in cement, second largest in the world. We have 500 million square feet of construction every year in this country. We make 22 million two wheelers, 3.5 million four wheelers. This year will be the fifth largest economy with $2.6 trillion, overtaking France and the UK. And we are growing up. And I firmly believe by 2030, will be a $10 trillion economy. And uh, we will be dominant in this part of the world. And many things that the Narendra Modi government has done is helping us do that. For example, the reform that have happened in financial services, in FDI investment, in the defense area, the demonetization helped to clean up the system. The bankruptcy law has come in to put all this crony capitalism into bankruptcy. It's happening. You see the results. And we see the GST come. GST is a fantastic thing. It's getting a national market. And the investment in railways, in power, in the road sector. I think India is a great growth story. And the stock markets are doing well. The stock markets have given 16% return year after year from 1991 till today. And that's a fantastic return. The only thing that we need for India is improve the brand because we have a lot of leftist malcontents, both within India who have been with the previous government and the previous dispensation and their cohabitants in the US and other places write nasty articles spreading lies about India, which we want to, which we have to counter. The MACD member on Twitter uh, countering all this kind of rubbish and lies that come on. So I think uh, my ambition is to make, to, to, to see India grow, uh, to see the GDP grow, to see the rise of this great country, to be a peaceful member of the international community, and to make sure that the Indian is respected all over the world. That was, that was breathtaking. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sri. Um, so um, the one startup that you've been associated with that has actually stood out for me because I go frequently to that site is the betterindia.com. Yes. Uh, uh, viewers, uh, just to give you a quick um, intro on that, please go and look at the betterindia.com. They only talk about the success stories in India. They go to nooks and crannies of the country all over, find how small common people have made a difference in the lives of either themselves or have enriched people around them. So uh, Mohandas Paiji, please tell us a little bit more about how you came about uh, uh, investing into a company like the Better India. I'm just taking one example. Yeah, you know, Better India was, uh, you know, I discovered the news portal on uh, Twitter because somebody tweeted that, I saw that and followed it for some time. Then I called Diman, who's the founder, and told him I want to invest and I just invested. Uh, <laughs> just because of it. This guy is fantastic. He and his wife are spending their whole life uh, putting forth the narrative of a great India where the people are doing extraordinary things and making their environment better for everybody and making them know that it's a very big country. There are only two countries, the billion population. So you can't compare India with the Singapore. You can't compare the Finland. You can't compare the US because none of them have the challenges or problems that we have. None of them have solved the problems of poverty, of growth, of managing a country of 1.3 billion people. Only China has done it. The only country you can compare is China and India. And they were spreading the good news, uh, making sure that we wake up in the morning fully charged when you read this news to know that great things are happening in this country. It's a very large country, Sri. And let me tell you, Sri, anybody in the world, Sri, can come out with a theory on any matter, come to India and find the data to justify the theory. We have 1,600 languages, 19 official languages, 29 states in India, each state larger than most countries in Europe. 
is a very, very large, complex country with many ethnicities, many languages working together to grow. And we are grown at 8.8% a year. It's a miracle that what has happened in this country. And I think we deserve the kind of credit for the people of this country, the political leadership, irrespective of who is in power, who are doing this abroad. And as a civilization, we have never conquered any country. We have never gone outside, conquered any country. We never spread bread and mayhem. We have been conquered for the last thousand years by the Islamic invaders and then by the British. And despite a thousand years of outside forces coming and dominating us, we are not lost our civilization. We are not lost our culture. We are not lost our languages. We are not lost our way of life. We are not lost our food. We are still the same great people. And this is a country where so many nationalities have come. We are given refuge to the Jewish people 2000 years ago. And nobody has persecuted the Jews. Show me one country in the world which has not persecuted the Jews and treated them with respect for 2000 years. We are given refuge to the Zoroastrians. Funny you should mention that. You know, when the Jewish state of Israel was formed, the very first resolution that they passed in their parliament was to thank India for being such a nice host. They said throughout the world, the Jews were persecuted, but you welcomed us as your own family. So thank you, India. So please continue, sir. Yes, and you must have 200 million Muslims in India. And these 200 million Muslims enjoy all the rights of a free constitution. The only other large country which has more Muslims in Indonesia, with maybe 230 million. We have 200 million Muslims. They have equality, they have all the rights. But people abuse us to say that we are a Hindu country. Yes, we are a Hindu majority country, 79%. We should be proud of that. Just like UK calls itself a Christian nation, America calls itself a Christian nation, Germany calls it a Christian nation, we are a Hindu nation. But we are a secular democracy. Our democracy, our constitution says that everybody has equal rights, we have the full freedom of religion. And this right is not given to any of those 53 Islamic nations. They persecute their minorities, they don't treat people well, and they dominate it. And here, in the last 10 years, more mosques and churches have come up than temples. So it's a great country where people live in peace. Yes, when 1.3 billion people live together, there are some conflict, there are some fight, there are some violence. But if you look at violence per million population, India comes very low. New York has possibly more murders and more rage per million population than India has. So we must look at India very, very differently. It's up to us, to all of us, to talk with data and facts about the India narrative. And just because India is very large, you'll have large number of things. For example, 400,000 people uh, possibly die of accidents every year in India. It looks very large, largest in the world, year largest in the world. But we have 1.3 billion people. If you look at it per million people, it's not so large. And if you look at uh, people who commit suicides, 200,000 people commit suicide in this country. About maybe 45,000 of them are farmers. But look at per million, it's not very large. And if you look at anything in this country, people always magnify what happens in India. But, you know, India is not large. <laughs> That's so true. So true. Um, so I just want to um, deal with a couple of things uh, that uh, I saw as uh, uh, that you are part of. Uh, I think you are one of the producers of an animated Samskritam um, uh, a movie called uh, Punya Koti. Yes. How did that come about? See, Punya Koti started by Ravi Kumar he used to work at Infosys. He sent me a mail one day saying I must uh, make animated Sanskrit story Punya Koti. And I said, I'll help you. Yes, I'll give some money. I put them on to <coughs> Vishwari to raise money and he's raised money. I think he's doing very well. Punya Koti is a fantastic story of all that is nice and good about this country. It's a story about a cow which has a calf and the cow along with his other members used to go to the forest to graze. And one day when it goes, a tiger catches it and the tiger catches it and wants to kill it and eat it for his, for his food. Then the cow looks at the tiger and says, oh tiger, <coughs> I have a young calf. My child is waiting for me. Let me go and let me feed it and tell the other cows to look after my child. Then I'll come back and then you can eat me. Now look at the nobility of the soul. The tiger is appearance. If I let you go, you will not come back. Oh tiger, I will come back. I give my promise. The tiger was somewhat moved. The tiger let Punya Koti go and Punya Koti went back to his herd and then called his calf and fed the calf and sang his song. He told everybody, you know, when this calf comes, do not, do not push it away. It is a motherless calf. I have to go and treat it well. Please feed it. Please look after. It is such a poignant story. When our parents, when the mother used to tell the story, we used to cry. 
Even now, I shed tears when I hear the story about the nobility of the soul. And Punya Koti then went back to the tiger and told the tiger, I told everybody that not to hurt my calf, I come back, now you can eat me. Look at the nobility of the soul. Look at the honesty. Look at the truth. And the tiger is so moved that he lets it go and, you know, goes away into the forest. And that's the story that is told to all of us. I mean, you are children by your mother and mothers used to sing the song of Punya Koti. And it is on these songs and everything that we were brought up. And it taught us ethics. It taught us to do good things. It taught us the value of promises. That whatever happens, you must keep your promise. Whatever happens, you must be truthful and honest. So, you know, this is our culture. So, I said we must support. I think it's finished most of it. Ilaya Raja is adding the lyrics. Hopefully it will come out. Now, if you, see, if you look into your culture, there's so many nice things about our culture. The Panchatantra is an Indian thing which went west. And it came into Arabic, it went into the Aesop fables and everything else. And our culture is all expansive. My brother, about 15 years ago, when he was much younger, he went on a motorcycle all the way from Bangalore to the Himalayas. And he told me, wherever he went, the poor people of this country welcomed him to the place, gave him shelter. If they had two rotis, they gave him the rotis to eat. They didn't eat. So, you know, our philosophy, Sukino Devo Bhava. I mean, you know, our, everybody should be happy. Huh? Atiti Devo Bhava. Atiti Devo, no, Sukino, the Atiti Devo Bhava. And uh, Sarve Jano Sukino Bhavantu. Uh, that's you true. Know, everybody be happy. That, you know, we pray for everybody. It's an inclusive open system. Hinduism is an inclusive open system where everybody can do what they want and everybody is welcome. It's part of a system. There is no dogma. And I think this is what we must preserve in a country. And this is the story we have to say. We have the basic fundamentals of sustainability for the world, Sri. Because Sri, our culture is based on working in harmony of nature. Our culture is not based on the conquest of nature. Our, our, our customs are based upon the respect for nature. To take from nature enough for sustenance, not take away from the future and to work with nature. That's why we worship nature. <clears throat> we, have a, we worship animals. People call us animals because they don't understand because we are not based on conquest. We are not based upon individual gratification. We are not based upon increasing individual consumption. We are family oriented. The family is important to us. People are important to us. We have an obligation society. So these are the good things that we must spread. And Punya Koti was one of those great things. So I said I must support this. This is a fantastic story. In fact, I remember uh, hearing this story from my mother growing up. And, and, and so this is amazing. I mean, we are so far apart. And yet that story, that, that concept of dharma by the cow, uh, it's embedded in H in my mind too. So thank you for making a movie and that too in Sanskrit. Because I believe it's one of those things that binds all of India. Sanskrit. Yes. Because yeah. you can find the commonality of Sanskritam in every language that has uh, spread the breadth and width of India. Yes, Sri, I must tell you this. I recently spoke in Rajiv Malhotra's Indology conference. And I made a speech and told people that, look, India is a very complex, large country. And we, all of us, have multiple identities. At the highest level, we are global. Then we are Indians. We are South Indians. I am a resident of Karnataka. I am a Kannadiga. Then I am a Bengali. Bokini speaking person. I'm a Gauda Saraswat. All right. Now I have all these multiple identities and each identity is important. Each identity should be invested in. We are not one single identity to say I'm an American or an Englishman and that is it. But we have this multiple identity based upon caste, based upon religion, based upon uh, you know, uh, language, based upon ethnicity and all the things are important. Now when people with multiple identities stay together in a very large country <laughs> and share the same space, we have to learn how to work with each other and how to make sure that we all join in certain activities which are common to us, like the protection of our country, like building this country, certain things in our state, building our state, building our city, without conflict with each other. And we need to understand this multiplicity. And we have this great ability to accept, accept the differences between us. But no civilization accepts differences. Civilization tolerate if at all. Now, the Western civilization tolerates everybody. They talk about tolerance. We talk about acceptance. Why do you talk about acceptance? Because we accept your right to be different. We don't tolerate your right to be different. Acceptance is inclusive. Toleration is patronage. Toleration is by my leave. I am tolerating you by my leave because I am superior to you, so I tolerate you. That's totally wrong. But we accept when acceptance is equality. And I think it's very, very, that's why 
you know, I spoke to them of multiple identities and says, that is what we must foster. And there was a debate about Sanskrit and Tamil. Tamil is a great language. Tamil is a old civilization. It's got a 4,000 year old history, great architecture, great literature, great song, music. It's a rich language. It's not in conflict with Sanskrit. Much of Sanskrit has come to Tamil too. Tamil has its own space, Sanskrit has its own space. They have met, they have shared. Both languages are learned together. Now, the certain set of people who want to rubbish Sanskrit saying the language of the oppressor, which is all rubbish, because these are all based on caste conflicts. I mean, based on you know conflicts. But we are not a country based on conflicts. We are a country which accepts everything and whatever prospers, prospers. I, I couldn't agree with you more uh, on, on that. Uh, so, Mohan Aspaji, uh, switching gears a little bit, um, I just want to um, set down the platform for our viewers about startups. Uh, viewers, um, when, when a startup has uh, uh, started in, uh, in the United States, uh, a resident in any state can uh, incorporate the company in any other state. For example, I live in California, but I have the option of incorporating my company in uh, California or neighboring De Nevada or across the uh, East Coast in Delaware or any other state I want. Each of these states have a little bit of benefits and, and so on, advantages and so on. So you can pick and choose what you want to do. Uh, now, in the United States, in a startup, anything that comes in as investment is not taxed. Only the income gets taxed. Now, there are different types of startups. You can have a C corporation, an S corporation, or you can have a limited uh, liability partnership. Now, there are equivalents of this in India also. Uh, now, Mohandas Paiji has been starting so many startup companies and uh, I would like Mohandas Ji to uh, share a few of your uh, concerns that have arisen in the recent times. And before you, before I yield the floor to you, sir, I want to tell you one little thing that in the United States, you can also start something called as not for profits. These are under 501C3. Uh, and, and these not for profit uh, startups, it's becoming harder and harder to register them now in the last two, three years. And the main reason for that is because this has become one tool for people to launder money when they do layering. And you can read about layering in pgurus.com. I've written extensively about it. One of the things they do is they, they create a, a, a startup, a, a not for profit. And, and that also could be a startup. And then they, you know, pass money through it. But that's just, an, uh, that's just more of an exception than the rule. There is no issue starting C Corps and S Corps and the other rules have not changed. So uh, Mohandas Paiji, why don't you draw the parallels with what you see in India and, and some of the new challenges that you see could be dealt better by the government. Well, Sri, let me start with giving you an overview of startups. <clears throat> there are five great innovation startup systems in the world. The United States is the largest, you know about that. <laughs> then you have in Europe, disparate between uh, London, Paris, Berlin, etc. and something small in the Nordics. Then you have Israel, very defense oriented, deep tech. Then you have India, which is the last system. And then you have China. Now, in India, we have 32,000 startups. They created $95 billion of value. Every year, we get nine to $10 billion of capital coming into the startup industry, out of which 10% is Indian money balances overseas money. We have about maybe 12 to 50 unicorns right now and a huge amount of money is coming and about six to 7,000 startups come up every year. So it's a very large system that's coming. 1,200, 1,300 startups get financed every year by venture capitalists and angel networks, rest are bootstrap. Of course, many of the bootstrap may disappear, but all this is available on a portal called Your Story. So you can check out the data yourself. Now you can have a startup as a sole proprietorship, as a partnership, as a limited liability partnership, as a limited liability company, or as a private company or a public company. So you have various categories of organization. And we also have a one-man company, uh, which can be set up with a limited liability under the Companies Act. Now, we have a National Companies Act. You can incorporate this company in any city of India, any place in India, everywhere, but be on the national registry. And it's very easy to set up a company. In about five days, you can set up a company. You get the name and everything in one single day. It is fully automated and it's very easy to set up. In India, has about 1.5 million companies at this point in time. As Indians, you can also set up a company outside India. You can remit money to up to $250,000. I could set up a company in Delaware. I could set up a company in New York. I could set up a company in London. 
I could set up a company in Singapore anywhere I want. So we're very free. It's a very free system. And as far as taxation is concerned, there's a special tax concessions given to startups under the Startup India. Many states in India like Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Rajasthan, Goa, etc. have startup policies. They give some incentives. <laughs> Government of India gives incentives. Government of India has got a $1.5 billion fund of funds on which the investment committee I sit is run by an organization called SIPI and they've given away uh, but, uh, maybe about $300 million uh, so far out of $1.5 billion to many, many companies and many, many funds and they're setting up various kind of funds. It's a very large ecosystem. There was one tax problem which I raised on Twitter and that was in 2012, the then government brought in a law to say that in case investment is made into private limited companies by individuals, they have to satisfy the valuation at which these investments are coming to the satisfaction of the tax officer. Now, some of the tax officers have been harassing people to say, you brought in this money, but the valuation is not right. I'm going to tax it as income in the hands of the company. And actually, they harass a few companies. So we represent the government. And government in 2016, July, came out of the rule that if you go to the government of India and you register, then this will not apply. It was infamously called angel tax. Recently, in uh, this month, uh, it's, uh, the income tax officer sent notices to more than 200 companies ask him to say why the valuation is there for companies have been set up earlier to this and many of them were on the verge of getting taxed so I tweeted to Arun Jaitley, the Prime Minister and everybody and the government is very concerned the tax department reached out to me, I gave them some data hopefully they'll solve the problem but this has been a legacy of the past but otherwise, you know, uh, we have a fairly good system and let me tell you, if you come here you can see the fervor of entrepreneurship and I believe these entrepreneurs are going to build the new India that Prime Minister Narendra Modi is talking about. Because we are having a generation of new entrepreneurs, fresh from college, people are coming out after working for 10, 15 years of starting companies. And together, they're creating a very, very vibrant uh, startup ecosystem. And very soon, I believe by 2020, will be the second largest in the world after the United States. I absolutely agree with you, Mohandas Ji, because I come to India about once every three months. And every time I come, I see something has improved, something better has happened. In fact, I used to, you know, be, uh, I used to direct the traffic in, in some cities, but somehow I have found ways to get around this also. Um, and, and for example, Uber has really made my life much, much easier now. I don't have to worry about where I'm going to park the car, assuming I'm driving around in the city and, and, and little, little things like this. And, and I feel that every time I come, I'm, I'm getting more things accomplished and I'm traveling to more places, meeting more people. So in, in, I, I completely agree with you because I'm, I'm not there, you see, but I'm coming there and I see that things are changing. The professionalism of people also has, has, has just floored me in sometimes because uh, they, I, I, I wouldn't expect that of them maybe 10, 15 years ago, and, and they say, no, no, it's okay, you know, we can do it this way. So what I'm trying to say, there's a general feeling of, you know, the nation is on the move. I, I completely agree with you on that. And that, that feeling comes, especially when I talk to the, the younger generations and, and, and they want to, you know, get ahead in life. I, I think uh, what you have done in terms of, you know, encouraging so many startups is a phenomenal thing. And I hope some of your um, erstwhile colleagues in, in um, Infosys and other places. I'm sure they are doing it too. I just don't know them as well as I know you. So uh, hopefully, you know, this will continue. <coughs> Excuse me. And Infosys, I'm sorry, not Infosys, Bangalore, I think is probably where the cradle of startup is. Sort of the, the Silicon Valley of India. But there's no reason why other states cannot come up with this. I know Hyderabad is very active. I know Gurugaon is very active. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about where the pockets of growth are happening. You see, the, uh, if you look at the pockets of growth, 80% of startups are in Bangalore, um, New Delhi, Gurugram, uh, Gur Gurgaon, and uh, Bombay. Then you've got Chennai and Hyderabad. Uh, Bangalore has 7,000 startups, 25,000 IT companies. There are 1.5 million people working in IT and BPO and KPO in Bangalore out of a population of 10 million. Bangalore has 150,000 chip designers and testers, the largest in the world. Uh, Bangalore has architects in... Uh, um, architects for aviation, Bangalore has uh, car designers, and Bangalore has everything that you want in any language, any technology that you want. It's very, very deep. With 25,000 companies, 450 Fortune 500 companies get their work out of Bangalore. There are about 600 labs and tech labs here, multiple accelerators, 100 funds. It's a very vibrant ecosystem. 
and uh, Bangalore thrives on IT, thrives on uh, innovation in a very big way. Of course, we have a challenges of infrastructure because for a population of 10 million, there are 7 million vehicles. There are about 1.5-2 million cars, there are about 4.5-5 million two-wheelers, the roads capacity has not grown. We only have a 42 kilometer metro. By 2022, we won't have 250 kilometers of metro. 76 kilometers of metro is just getting work is getting done right now. It will go into place by 2020. So a lot of things are happening in Bangalore. It's a vibrant civil community. Now, Delhi and Gurgaon too has got a very large ecosystem, maybe 6,000 startups. Mumbai has got a very large uh, ecosystem too, maybe 5,000 startups. Uh, Delhi, Bangalore is technology and deep technology. Delhi is more B2C and meet the customer and uh, Bombay is more in the creative and in the B2C. Chennai is coming up in a small way. Uh, Hyderabad is a real good winner. I think we're seeing vibrancy there. Pune is coming up. Uh, Chennai needs much more. They have to be more welcoming to the outsider and not having a government in place with all these AI, DMK, DMK, all these fight, unnecessary things. I think they're losing out a big time. And uh, in Hyderabad, KTR is doing a fantastic job uh, because I think he's getting everybody in and Hyderabad is booming. It was not booming two years ago, but now I think it's booming, going well. Pune is a quite star with deep technology. So you see this happening across a vast country. And I think each of these cities, each of these big cities could be globally a massive player. Now, when you look at global rankings, Bangalore, of course, comes on top. Others don't come on top because uh, they don't capture the data, first of all. They don't look at the right database. NASCOM says there are only 4,000 or 5,000 startups in India which are wrong. Because when the government of Karnataka wanted registration of startups from Bangalore, four and a half thousand from Bangalore alone, Karnataka alone registered. And you know, they got wrong data. So uh, your story has got the current amount of data. They released a report saying this year we got $9.75 billion of money coming in. $9.75 billion of money coming in is very, very serious money. And I think in the next two or three years, these startups are going to solve India's problems. What are India's problems? India's problems are creating a single national market. With GST, it becomes seems easy. Financial services and deepening of the financial markets and the credit markets. Making sure that logistics cost comes down, supply chain efficiency, logistics costs are a very, very big factor to improve productivity. Education and technologies like Beiju, which is a star. Beiju was a, a company that we funded with the first check four and a half years ago. It's now a unicorn. Zuckerberg's family office has got an investment there. And uh, we have in education, in health technologies, wonderful innovation in health using AI, ML, etc. And then if you look at other areas like uh, handicrafts being uh, exposed to the market, agri-tech, defense tech, a lot of wonderful things happening. Uh, that's a wonderful roundup that you have given for the startup scenario in India. Uh, if anyone from the world is looking at India to invest, I think this video would be an excellent uh, source of information. And uh, I really thank you for uh, taking time out on you from your busy schedule to talk to me today. Uh, thank you. Once again, thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank it's you. a pleasure. And I hope to uh, talk to you again very soon. Thank you very much. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.